Let me just say first, in terms of all the communication technologies that are available to a homeowner or to a utility to do demand response, while there are pros and cons for each of these variety of technologies, there is no one clear, clear winner that wins every one of them. So we're going we're gonna to have to look at each individual utility's situation and apply them in the best way that we have. Paging has been around for many, many years. It's been very cost effective simply because it's a very short burst of message that gets communicated to a large population of devices very quickly. And as a result, a utility can get a instant, almost instantaneous response to that command. You have a very low cost system that works very, very well and very, very fast. The downside of paging is very, very simple. It's a one way. So you can get all the messages out from your utility office to all these devices, but you really don't have any feedback whether any of those devices actually got it or not. So you're counting on that your system is working properly and that your devices are working properly. And as a result, you have to go out and periodically check to see if your devices are actually still connected to the air conditioner and if they are still working and still getting to signal. So there is a recurring operational maintenance cost, if you will, with one-way paging. AMI is a great technology. It's a two-way technology that enables utilities to get meter readings from every house without dispatching any res human resources. It also allows utility to um, remotely control, disconnect homes, or to have outage management, outage uh, notifications, so that they can manage their grid much, much better. So it's a great medium. The problem with AMI, using AMI for demand response, is latency. The speed for which you can take your control event signal and dispatch them to hundreds and thousands of devices. And the reason why it's um, a issue with AMI is because they have to send each of these messages one at a time. So think about as you scale your, device, your system to hundreds of thousands of devices, you're sending hundreds of thousands of messages to every device. And that takes time. So that is the problem, if you will, or the barrier for de deploying demand response solutions in an AMI system. Now, for a utility, if you can dispatch your command the day before your event actually happened, it works very, very well because you can send a signal, the system, the AMI system will propagate that signal through the AMI system and every device will get the signal before the event actually needed to get started the next day. So all of that will work very, very well. However, if you have a need, as most of our utilities do, to dispatch the control event 10 minutes, 30 minutes before an event is starting, that signal won't get there in that 10 to 30 minutes. And that's been the problem or challenge with an AMI system. Another challenge with an AMI system is the protocols that are used. For example, Zigbee. Zigbee Smart Energy Profile is the standard protocol that is being uh, defined and used for ZigBee-enabled AMI devices. It works very, very well for dispatching a control event to the device and having a response back from the device. However, when you want to get richer functionality, and what I mean by richer functionality would be for a thermostat. For example, with a ZigBee thermostat, you want to have the ability to program by the, cus by the consumer uh, on that thermostat schedule, or they want to be able to remotely change the set point because now you have this rich two-way network, you want to provide some of those customer engagement functionalities. Those are not available through that standard Zigbee Smart Energy Profile protocol. And so you're limited in that perspective, that 
you have a two-way system, but you're not able to uh, engage with the customer for that. But here's the advantage of an AMI system. It's always on. It's a utilities network. So they have um, the assurance that, if, assuming that they maintain the AMI network properly, which they will, that it's always there and it always will connect to the device. They don't have to depend on somebody else's network. So Zigbee Broadband was another alternative that um, Converge has uh, brought forward in the marketplace as a way to get around the AMI Zigbee challenges. And for that solution, we use the gateway that is installed and connected to the customer's broadband through the Ethernet router. And that created the Zigbee network. Instead of going through a smart meter Zigbee network, we go through a gateways uh, Zigbee network. And the advantage of that is, number one, it allowed us to overcome some of the limitations of the smart energy profile. Uh, we were able to get richer thermostat functionalities of how allowing the customer to program, set their thermostat settings um, through a web portal, through a mobile application. Um, it was fast. I mean, it doesn't have the same latency challenges that an AMI system has because it's using a broadband connection. So it's all IP connection directly to the gateway. Your command dispatch gets there immediately. The challenge we have with using a gateway solution is it is the point of failure for every communication. So for example, if a customer disconnects their router or disconnect their gateway, it tears the whole Zigbee network down. You have no communication to the device at all. You are now dependent on the customer having the gateway plugged in, powered, and connected to their router. Without that, you have no connection. And so while you were able to get a rich functionality you were able to get fast speed. It all depended on the router, I'm, I'm sorry, on the gateway being there, powered and functioning properly. And in terms of a third variant of the AMI deployment that's now becoming more common um, is a direct-to-grid model. And what that is, is instead of using the meter as a gateway between the AMI network and a Zigbee network inside the home, uh, the, you deploy the AMI radio inside your demand response devices, inside your low control switch, for example. And what that allowed the utility to do is, one, still leverage the robustness of the AMI network, but it eliminated some of the downfalls of a Zigbee. So, for example, you don't have a Zigbee network to create anymore. The device, the demand response slow control switch, is actually hanging on the same AMI network as the smart meter. So you eliminate one layer of networking and its latency. Second, you can now create all of these functionalities that you want. You're not limited to the smart energy profile anymore. Uh, however, you still have the challenge of the speed and latency of the AMI network. However, that whole issue has been addressed or is being addressed by the AMI vendors today by improving their AMI functionalities with broadcast capabilities and uh, faster speed uh, nodes and so forth and so on. Cellular um, is a public two-way network and with all of the smartphones, tablets, uh, that are in everyone's home, it becomes um, a very ubiquitous network. And it has all of the good functionalities of high speed, uh, good coverage, uh, and you can get the full two-way functionality, the two-way two richness of customer engagement as well as demand response. The challenge for cellular are several. One, it's a higher cost equipment. The cellular modem is going to be higher cost than a Zigbee modem or a paging receiver. Um, the, there are recurring monthly data charges. 
So as a utility, you have to look at how much it costs you to run a, de uh, a device on a cell plant. It's no different than your smartphone that you have today. Um, and another challenge is just a technology evolution and end of life. So for example, we have 2G, 3G, 4G today. AT&T, for example, has already announced the end of life for a 2G GSM in 2017. They have not announced anything else. Um, Verizon has considered end of life their 2G and 3G in 2012, for example. So for utility, this obsolescence needs to be considered when they deploy these devices because they have to deploy these devices for a 10 to 15 year duration. And so you have to figure out, does that match with your needs? Wi-Fi, well, Wi-Fi is so ubiquitous in customers' homes today. Again, because of so many smartphones, uh, devices, laptops that are prevalent in customers' homes today. It is a network that is high speed. It's there for the customer to use for their own uh, use and need. And if you can tap into that from a utility perspective, it's free. So it makes great economic sense from that perspective. So all the good things, high speed, low latency, richness of functionality. The challenge with Wi-Fi is that it depends on the customer's network. And there are two major issues associated with that. One is security keys. You know, every device that you own and you put on your Wi-Fi network, you have to put in your SSID and your security key into that device before it can connect to your router. Not a lot of people, uh, I should say, some people would be Challenge, technically challenged to know what that is and how to operate that. And secondly, if their router fails or they change their router, then your device that utility has placed inside a customer premise needs to also change its security keys. If it doesn't happen, your device is now offline. The second is no different than the other uh, situation with the gateway, which is if the customer turns off their Wi-Fi router because they are concerned about security, hacking, or power consumption, uh, it again becomes a disconnected device. The driver to help mitigate some of those concerns will be if your device like a thermostat engages with the customer, there's an incentive for the customer to keep that device online. And that will work very well to some degree and will help in improving the connectiveness of the device, but it doesn't guarantee it. So that becomes, like I said, some of the challenges of Wi-Fi. It's how do you keep the devices connected online? As, as security keys get changed, routers get changed, those are some of the challenges for utility, keeping up with Wi-Fi. There are so many uh, pros and cons, different pros and cons for each type of technology. And each utility is unique and different in the sense of what they currently have, where they want to go, what's important to them. You know, a utility who may be wanting to get into customer engagement will have a very different need than a utility who wants to uh, get megawatts and only get megawatts, and that's their primary interest. It also depends on what they currently have. You know, the investment that a utility has already made uh, sometimes drives what type of technology you want to evolve them into. Um, and so all of these pros and cons needs to be worked with, in collaboration with the utility to determine what is the best technology for them to move forward with? Another point I want to make is there is not only one, as I said earlier. Sometimes what may help is a mixture, a blend of some of these technologies together because every technology has holes. There are going to be some customer in their service territory that don't have cellular, some that don't have Wi-Fi, 
Paging coverage is not going to be everywhere. So as a result of all that, you are going to find that sometimes you need a blend of different technology to complete the whole picture. And that's where Converge can help by discussing all of these uh, pros and cons and the advantages and disadvantages as well as the cost for all of these technologies and having a solution that can work with that blend of technology so that it becomes a single solution for the customer. So that's where Converse can help.